Hi everyone, welcome to the Why Medium Chain Triglyceride Fats Matter and Clinical Utilization Webinar. We are so glad you have taken the time out of your busy day to join us. I wanna start by introducing myself and my co-presenter, Lauren Cronish. My name is Laura Doherty, and I'm a registered dietitian with both a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Dietetics. I am currently the National Clinical Manager at Nutritional Medicinals, LLC. My clinical specialty uh, historically has been in pediatrics and ketogenic diet therapy for neurological disorders where I practiced clinically both at Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis and uh, more recently at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston for 14 years. Now on to my amazing co-presenter today, Lauren Cronish has been a pediatric ketogenic dietitian for nine years. She also has experience working with pediatric patients who have EOE, FPIs, and food allergies. She is currently the clinical dietitian coordinator for the ketogenic diet program at Texas Children's Hospital's Bluebird Epilepsy Clinic. Lauren earned her MS in clinical nutrition from Rutgers University School of Health Profession, Professions excuse me, in New Jersey, where she also completed her dietetic internship and DPD certification. And uh, these are our disclosures for today. Today, I'm gonna start off by focusing on the differences in MCT digestion and absorption compared to other types of fat, as well as some other important clinical differences. Lauren, when we get to her part of the presentation, is gonna dive into disease states and conditions where MCTs can improve clinical outcomes and then we're both gonna kind of tag team on the best practices and practical tips and tricks for incorporating MCT into food and beverages for your patients uh, throughout the presentation. So let's start by going back in time to our biochemistry class. I think it's important to quickly review fat nomenclature so we have a good understanding of different types of fat and their digestive process. So simply here, uh, to form a fat, you start with a glycerol backbone that consists of a three carbon chain. Then attached to these three carbons on the backbone is a fatty acid. A fatty acid is a carboxylic acid within a um, chain, which is either saturated or unsaturated, depending on if it has a single or double bond. And most naturally occurring fatty acids have an unbranched chain of an even number of carbon atoms. So generally anywhere from four to 28. So when we dig into the, the fatty acid structure just a little bit deeper, we have short chain fats, which consist of two to five carbons. Uh, ex examples would be say C2, which is acetate, C3 being propanate, and C4 is butyrate. And about 95% of short chain fatty acids fit into one of those three. Only minimal amounts of short chain fatty acids are, are really found in nature. Um, a small amount in butter really, but mostly short chain fatty acids are formed as a byproduct of your good bacteria and play an integral role to maintain gut health as well as an energy source. The best way to increase your short chain fatty acid is by feeding your gut bacteria more fiber. Uh, but unfortunately, I could talk more about short chain fatty acids. I think they're amazing. But today we're going to talk about medium chain triglycerides or medium chain fatty acids. And those are going to be anywhere, um, and those are pictured here, and they're going to be anywhere from six to 12 carbons in length. We're really going to focus on C8 through C12 today. So C8 is going to be uh, your caprylic acid. C10, your capric acid, and C12, your lauric acid. The longer the MCT carbon chain, the more digestion is required. So lauric acid, being C12, can emulate properties of both long chain and medium chain fatty acids, and it does take longer to digest. Long chain fats, um, as the third category that I'm just gonna briefly mention here, those are gonna be your fatty acids with carbons anywhere from 13 to 24 plus. Those are really well known. Um, you know, your omega-3s are gonna be your long chain fatty acids, your stearic acid, your oleic acid, 
uh, those are all going to be um, long chain and they're found in abundance in the food supply. So switching back uh, to our primary focus today, uh, the primary sources of MCTs in our diet consist of dairy products, which are about 10 to 12 percent MCTs, palm kernel oil, which is about 50 percent MCT, and then the hot food in today's market, coconut oil, which is 60 percent MCT. It's important as we go through this webinar and we analyze some of this data to realize that the MCT found in coconut oil is lauric acid, which is C12. Compared to coconut oil, dairy products and the palm kernel oil, they do tend to have higher proportions of C8 and, C12, and C10, but they overall have a smaller quantity of MCTs. I do want to mention uh, the formula sources of MCT as well, because some of the case studies and research articles Lauren's going to discuss are based on formulas with MCT included. In the formula market, you can find modular MCTs, both non-emulsified, so uh, a pure MCT, or emulsified, which is going to have a stabilizer added and generally various water amounts for dilution. But because of that stabilizer, because of that emulsifier, it's gonna stay in solution a bit better. In the infant formula market, you can find infant formula, formulas, excuse me, that don't contain any MCT all the way up to about 65% of their fat from MCT for some of those more specialized products. And that's similar for the pediatric and adult formula world where you have a lot of products that don't have any MCT and then you have products that have up to 60% of their fat from MCT for, again, more specialty products. So I'm going to go back in time again and, and talk about how uh, MCT oil was kind of uh, discovered or invented, per se. For the greater part of the 20th century, MCTs were only consumed from natural food sources like butter and coconut oil. And, and we truly didn't know a lot about these fats. This was really the case until the early 1980s when a researcher at the Nutrition Laboratory at Harvard developed a process to produce MCTs in larger quantities and in a pure source. The end product of this new discovery was MCT oil as we kind of know it today. His intention was really to use it for the treatment of several medical conditions, such as uh, pancreatic insufficiency, and fat malabsorption. But it quickly became a huge hit in the supplement industry as well. So the oil itself is made from pure MCTs extracted from whole foods, primarily coconut and palm. And this chart here kind of outlines the four different MCTs and what foods, or maybe lack thereof, these MCTs can be found as well as some other important properties that can impact palatability and tolerance. For example, for MCT oil processing, uh, usually lauric acid, so again, your C12, and caproic acid, your C6, is entirely removed during the MCT oil making process. That is because it makes a more palatable and high quality product. While C6, because it's a really short chain, is really easily absorbed, it also has a really unpleasant taste and smell. On the other hand, C12, which takes longer to absorb, um, may not give you the same clinical benefit as using a C8 or C10. Most MCT oils on the market are going to be a blend of C8 and C10. Although you can, some of them are 100% one or the other. You may see, uh, I think one, a lot of them are around 50 to 80% C8 and 20 to 50% C10. Um, but honestly, I've seen it all over the spectrum, but that just kind of gives you a general rule of thumb of why you'll see C8, C10 in the MCT oil market, while coconut oil that you might buy from the grocery store is gonna be more of a C12. In order to be absorbed, long chain fats, which again are 13 to 24 carbon atoms in length. So we're looking at the second part of this diagram here. 
they require pancreatic biliary lipolysis and emulsification to be broken down into glycerols and free fatty acids, which then they have to be entered into an enterocyte and subsequent production of a chylomicron. In contrast, MCTs, which again are six to 12 carbons in length, are absorbed passively. They bypass the need for complex lipolysis and emulsification. In fact, although the long chains are packaged into chylomicrons going through the lymphatic system prior to reaching the liver, MCTs can be taken up directly into the portal circulation. In the liver, MCTs can move passively across that double membrane of the mitochondria and be used as an immediate source of energy, while long chain fats require transportation through the carnitine cycle. So for visual representation, you will see, excuse me, you will see here circled or boxed in red, the steps that long chain fatty acids have to go through for digestion that MCTs do not. Simply put, MCTs require no bile, no pancreatic lipase enzymes, no chylomicron formation, and they are absorbed directly into the liver. Long chains require that bile component, that um, pancreatic lipase component, and again, that chylomicron micelle formation for digestion and assimilation. We have already discussed a few topics on this chart, but I wanna include it because I think it's a nice overview of MCTs and long chain fats. A few additional points to point out is that MCTs are actually water soluble and have a low smoke point, while long chain fats are lipid soluble and have a much higher smoke point. Where this becomes incredibly important for educating uh, clients and patients is that you really should not be cooking with MCT oil due to their low smoke point. Now, this is also where coconut oil gets a little bit gray because since it's primarily lauric acids, C12, a longer chain, it does have a higher smoke point than the C8s and C10s you're gonna find in an MCT oil product. Another important difference between these two types of fats is the calorie difference. MCTs are 8.3 calories per gram, why long chains are gonna be closer to 9.2. As I mentioned before, lauric acid is the majority of the MCT found in coconut oil. It's absorbed more slowly and metabolized in some ways more like long chain fatty acids. In recent years, coconut oil has emerged as a potential, and I'm using quotes here, miracle food some media vehicles assume that this fat is capable of promoting health benefits, such as weight reduction, cholesterol lowering, uh, prevention of cardiovascular disease, anti-inflammatory, and I could go on and on. However, government agencies in many countries are still skeptical about the benefits obtained through the consumption of coconut oil due to its high saturated fat. So for the next two slides, I'm gonna talk about some coconut oil research that applies more to the general population because it is a hot topic. I made the assumption we get some questions about it, so I just wanna briefly mention it. Now, this is not related to somebody who's using MC, who's using coconut oil for a GI-related uh, reason or even a ketogenic-related related reason, so not necessarily medical nutrition therapy, but really just looking at coconut oil for the general population. So in light of this controversy of uh, some studies saying it's beneficial, some studies saying it's not beneficial, and a lot of confusion in the marketplace, there was a review that was published in 2016 that focused on analyzing the published literature on the alleged health claims in order to investigate if there truly was scientific evidence to support them. And that reference will be on your reference sheet that you get with your CP certificate. In that review, many studies reported that the product was not efficient in weight loss and you know, the consumption of coconut oil increased LDL levels, um, consequently potentially increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease. On the other hand, some studies showed that it was beneficial uh, for some of these claims. So the, it was really, really mixed reviews. 
But in general, the study showed these conflicting results and kind of left it at, um, warrantedly so, you know, more long-term human-based clinical trials were needed. A few other things to keep in mind is that many health claims for coconut oil research use a special formulation or a pharmaceutical grade of coconut oil made with more MCTs altered with different types of MCTs, so maybe C8, C10s, and is really not the same as the coconut oil you might find at the grocery store. So to make a complex topic even more complex, you know, not all coconut oil is created equal. When looking at epidemiology studies on the use of coconut products in cultures such as uh, the Philippines, New Zealand, um, New Guinea, where you have a traditional diet that consumes large amounts of the entire coconut, in addition to consuming a large amount of the entire coconut, they also have a diet that's traditionally high in fruits and vegetables, uh, really high in seafood, and low in processed and refined sugars. If you look at those studies, individuals who had higher amounts of coconut oil had increased HDL cholesterol, which would be beneficial, but also increased total cholesterol and triglycerides. And so while those studies show a more concrete benefit of coconut oil, I think it's important to realize that they eat the whole coconut in the content of a very healthy diet, which may not apply to all Western diets. Looking at some other review articles on coconut oil that looked more on the cardiovascular risk benefits or, or lack of benefits, the first included an eight clinical trial that lasted anywhere from five to eight weeks. So this is a review article. And the study had anywhere from nine to 83 participants. When compared with butter or unsaturated fats, coconut oil raised total cholesterol, HDL, and LDL levels more than unsaturated oils, but did not raise it more than butter. Okay. And then, you know, coconut oil was also found to raise total and LDL cholesterols to a similar degree as other saturated fats like beef fat and palm oil. In another 16 clinical trial meta-analysis, coconut oil was found to increase both LDL and HDL cholesterol levels compared with non-tropical vegetable oil, so uh, like safflower oil or canola oil. But the reality is when we start looking at these individual studies in detail, I think the downfall is that they have, they, it wasn't a very long duration. The subject uh, volume was, was pretty low and the specifics on the coconut oil product used were really mixed with some being grocery store, some being specialty products, some being C8, some being C10. There, it's all across the, the board. And, I don't think, or I don't know, if it's fair to compare those MCTs as just one grouping versus the individual unique properties of each of those MCTs. And that's getting down to the nitty gritty. And I realize uh, as a nutrition researcher, that's hard, but I think um, it, it's kind of comparing apples and oranges at times. The other thing I think that we have to do an evaluation of is that let's look at the overall diet you know, because that has got to have a different outcome if you're doing coconut oil with a diet that's really high in refined carbs and refined sugar and animal fats versus a diet that's high in fruits, vegetables, and more plant-based, or, uh, you know, a lot more seafood, or, you know, those, the overall diet is really potentially key here. So while I'm not anti or pro coconut oil in the general population, I'm more of in the stance as a clinician that we definitely need more research. Probably we don't need to have this one size fits all approach to coconut oil. I think we have to consider the individual person's unique needs. And I think we definitely need more studies on the individual uh, medium chain triglycerides and those their impacts. So let's compare, you know, just to have a better understanding of coconut oil versus MCT oil when you're looking at it in the marketplace. 
Coconut oil, again, it's roughly about 60% MCT with most of it being lauric acid. It is easier to tolerate um, as documented in some studies and it does have a higher smoke point. So it is acceptable to use for some cooking methods. MCT oil, on the other hand, 100% MCT, it's gonna be primarily C8 and C10, but because it's a more potent source of MCT, it can be harder to tolerate. So from a clinical perspective, if you are really looking for your patient to get C8 and C10, because maybe the concerns for the C12 uh, being longer chain and maybe emulating more of a long chain fat, then MCT oil is the way to go because there's only about 14 and 7% of coconut oil that's actually C8 and C10. So you would have to have about seven times or let's say one tablespoon of MCT oil would give you the same amount of C8 and C10 as seven tablespoons of coconut oil. So in that situation, MCT oil is giving you a huge bang for, for your tablespoon. MCT formulations, now here we're talking just 100% MCT here. So MCT formulations, you'll see liquids on the market. Those are probably the most readily available. They're generally the, the least expensive. And that's just made from extracting the oil from typically co coconut or palm kernel um, and then refining it. MCT powder is also available on the market, and I have used this quite a bit in my practice, mainly if I run into a situation where the liquid is not being tolerated. It does seem to be a little bit more gentle on the stomach. Um, it is turned into a powder by a process called spray drying. So basically all that means is they, are, they evaporate the moisture out of it with hot air. And then to complete the process, they generally combine it with a carrier powder. Usually you're gonna see a fiber as that carrier powder. So the powders are more expensive. They, you generally have to do more, a higher volume to get the same amount of MCT as you would a liquid. Um, they sometimes will contain additives and fillers, but that's just not completely across the board. Um, and then one that's not researched here is uh, MCT gel caps or tablets or um, gels. I don't generally use those very much in my practice because it takes a ton of them to get up to any type of reasonable dose for what my goals are, um, but they are available on the market as well. So I am now going to hand this over to Lauren um, so she can dig into more of the clinical aspect of things. Hello, everyone. Give me a minute to just minimize my webinar panel and maximize my slide deck. And I swear this <laughs> went much better in practice. Okay, I am going to talk a little bit about um, clinical utilization um, it, for MCT oil in various health conditions. And before I do that, I just like to share and call back to my experience that my main, I use MCT oil all the time, but my main reason for using it is in my practice as a ketogenic dietitian. And so uh, some of these other disorders I'm gonna discuss, it was really fun to delve into, but uh, I'm more an expert in the neurology reasons for using MCT oil. And so um, while everything else is research-based, it's just kind of a sampling and I am definitely not an expert on that. Okay. So clinical utilization for MCT oil, uh, some GI related reasons why you might wanna use MCT oil. And I'll explain a little bit further on the reasons why for each and specific examples and case studies are abdominal surgery or resection, celiac disease, sometimes reactions after severe food allergies, colon cancer, gallbladder disease, hepatic disease, pancreatic insufficiency, constipation, other reasons why there are certain conditions where you might use MCT oil, Alzheimer's disease, conditions where you utilize a ketogenic diet, such as traumatic brain injury, 
um, and sometimes in congestive heart failure or burn patients, and sometimes for overall cognitive health, which will make a little bit more sense once I delve a little bit into the research. Okay, so times where MCT would absolutely be an inappropriate use uh, are in some of our fatty acid metabolism disorders, such as MCAT or medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. Uh, in any case where somebody has excessive diarrhea because it has a higher osmolality and some people take MCT to go to the bathroom better, so it could exacerbate that in diarrhea. Any history of intolerance to MCTs, usually it's related to some sort of um, GI symptoms. An allergy to the food the MCT is derived from, namely coconut or palm. Presence of a porticavel shunt, um, not using it because of its low smoke point. So it absolutely should not be baked with in the oven or fried with some light sautés. Okay, but if you remember back the slide that Laura was discussing, the smoke point is 320 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, on induction ovens, for example, the stovetop gets hot really quickly. So you'd have to use your judgment, and it should never be used as the sole source of fat due to the risk of essential fatty acid deficiency. It doesn't contain any of those essential fatty acids that we need. And certain clinical situations, pharmaceutical grade MCT might be stronger indicated than in others. I talked to um, a liver transplant dietitian who says it in their practice, the whole team prefers pharmaceutical grade because it's less costly for families if they can get it covered through a medical supplies company. Um, or it could be that it's more standardized product uh, when it's pharmacy grade. However, you really have to take this into account um, with your particular client or patient. Uh, for example, if it's not covered, the pharmaceutical grade might be a higher price point in the store. And so then it's more feasible for them to use whichever one they can or one that's on sale. And so you kind of have to take that into account. Um, other conditions where you should discuss with a healthcare provider before using include cirrhosis, liver disease, high blood pressure inside the liver, brain, or nervous system complications caused by liver damage. Okay, so now I'm going to delve a little bit into the research on MCT and conditions utilizing a ketogenic diet. A couple I'll touch on in the neurology, CR, Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, and epilepsy. Okay. So just first a quick overview or a refresher for some of you of Alzheimer's disease. It's the most common form of dementia. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Um, there are treatments, but no cures. And some of these treatments are not successful in helping the symptoms for everyone who experiences Alzheimer's, just some people. Those include ACE inhibitors or improvement of certain lifestyle factors. Many of the risk factors for development of Alzheimer's disease are based in bodily inflammation and oxidative stress. Um, and brain glucose metabolism is the target of the hunt for more treatment right now. Okay, so based on the research right now, it does seem like there's an impaired glucose metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. There's a reduced use of the GLUT3 transporter. There's a reduced glycolytic flux and there's increased brain glucose concentration. So the brain is not metabolizing blood sugar the way that it did before. And so this is where the thinking that ketones is an alternative brain fuel source through the use of the ketogenic diet or just MCT oil on its own together with uh, a typical diet might help improve the brain metabolism people who have Alzheimer's disease. And um, this is just a visual from a Chinese researcher about Alzheimer's disease to kind of just show you what I'm talking about. Uh, I thought also found it really interesting that um, in the research, if you study the glucose metabolism of people, some of them are showing reduced glucose metabolism in the brain 10 to 15 years before they show any Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease symptoms. And this reduced cerebral metabolic output can lead to cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's as suggested by the research. In other words, um, an improvement on brain metabolism might help people 
at risk for Alzheimer's, not just uh, people who already have Alzheimer's. And pretty much because age, advancing age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, we all do, though um, we know from the research that people who have the E4 allele of the APOE4 gene might have even more potential benefit in this because they're more at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. We don't quite know why in the research, but if you think back to your school days, for a lot of you, that APOE4 gene is uh, one of the codes for how we metabolize cholesterol in our bloodstream. Other risk factors for Alzheimer's include other genetic polymorphisms, genetic hormone changes, lifestyle factors, cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemias, hypertension, obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. Some of these are preventable risk factors, but many of them are ways that create oxidative stress and inflammation, and some of them are not able to be controlled, like especially the genetic factors. So this is why there's so much interest in seeing um, if we can find some better treatments. So in Alzheimer's disease, some possible uses for MCT oil in the research um, are to use it in supplementation with a regular diet. So in this 2009 double-blinded placebo-controlled study uh, for 90 days of 152 participants with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, uh, NCT was supplemented to give moderate ketosis with a regular diet, and it was correlated positively with a significantly improved cognitive scoring, um, a validated ABA COG scoring, 45 days in, so about halfway in as compared to the placebo group. And I really like that one because it's an RCT and there weren't very many RCTs to be found. Um, and in another 2014 study of 30 participants with moderate to severe Alzheimer's, 20 grams of coconut oil per day, so not MCT, but coconut oil, improved validated um, AD assessment scale of cognitive subscale and the clinician's interview-based impression of change plus caregiver's input, which I'm sure these validated scoring tools could be a lecture on their own, but they're validated scoring for measuring the progression of Alzheimer's disease. However, a limitation of this study was that there wasn't a placebo group for here. Okay, so I wanted to get a better handle on the overview besides, I wanted to give you some good primary data and then I kind of wanted to back out and give more of a scenic overview. Um, so I took a look at a study that just came out in January, 2023 in um, a journal called Nutrition Review. And they did a systematic review of MCT oil and the use of Alzheimer's disease. And there were 17 studies examined and they concluded that further research is needed to determine if the increase in brain energy metabolism that MCT causes can really improve cognition in Alzheimer's or those at risk for it. In other words, even though we know that there's this reduced brain metabolism with of glucose for people with Alzheimer's, we still need to prove better whether MCT really can improve it, even though if you looking at the science in the slides before, it makes sense. There's not a ton of uh, those gold standard RCTs available to us, and so we need to research further. Okay, another condition in which MCT oil supplementation might be helpful is in traumatic brain injury. And so um, traumatic brain injury is defined as an injury that impacts the brain. It can cause disability and death. In the US in 2019, there were 223,000 reported TBIs and they can be mild, moderate, or severe concussion grading and or a result of gunshot wounds. They can be long-term, they can be short-term, and sometimes they do have permanent effects on people. So um, just to share from this uh, longer-term outcomes to just understand about TBI, because I don't know about you, but whenever I think of TBI, I just think of concussions, but it's not just that. And, I think there's more awareness these days with CTE, but there can be shorter term or longer term impacts. And so um, from the TBIMS database, 22% um, survey died, 30% symptoms became worse over five years, 22% stayed the same and 26% improved. So it may or may not be appropriate to use with TBI, but I mean, 30% 
experiencing worse symptoms tells me that um, there's a lot of room to help. And the baseline of thinking about using this, it, it could there could be a couple of different reasons. So in the case that I'm about to discuss, um, the reason why it was utilized is because as a result of the TBI, the person experienced seizures for the first time in their life. And so they were um, we were using NCT in the context of the ketogenic diet to help control their seizures that were as a result of the TBI. Um, but there could be some reason to use it otherwise. Okay. So um, the case study about the TBI, um, patient's name was Billy Madison. He was an 18 year old male, 204 pounds, um, completely healthy, no significant health history. And he had flipped off a motorcycle resulting in a TBI. And he was in our neuro ICU. He had a medically induced coma for, due, to help control his seizures. They also induced hypothermia therapy through the kitchen sink of medications add-in to try and help control the seizures. But after he was taken out of the medically induced coma, his seizures continued and they weren't well controlled um, just with the medications being provided. And so that's where nutrition got consulted in four weeks into his admission. The ketogenic diet was initiated via, via NG tube and um, the patient was starting to wake up in the week or two into starting the ketogenic diet. So um, first we started him on a four to one ketogenic diet titrated over three to four days with no calories from NCT. And at that point we were having um, 0.8 millimoles per liter in his blood ketones, which is really trace ketosis. Um, but a lot of times in the ICU, we have unavoidable carbohydrates from meds or perhaps a patient's body uh, due to the inflammation that they have as a result of what's going on. Sometimes uh, we're not able to get to the ideal range of ketosis, which is three to five millimoles per liter. And so that's a time when we would utilize MCT oil to try and help either counteract the carbs from meds with more fat or just try and optimize the diet. So um, we started adding in MCT oil to the non-MCT oil keto formula um, while still on a ketogenic diet to provide 20% of calories once it was titrated up. Um, so always with MCT oil, you start slow and you add on to make sure that you have adequate tolerance, you don't have um, loose stools. And um, it was successful in this case a week after adding the MCT into the formula, there were significantly improved seizures and that blood ketone of the beta hydroxybutyrate boosted way up from the 0.8 trace to um, high 3.2 millimoles per liter. Um, there were reduced bowel movements and some abdominal distension at first, which can happen when MCT oil is started. Um, usually not the reduced bowel movements, uh, usually you get the same amount of bowel movements or more, and you have to watch out for loose stools with the MCT oil. But it is normal to have some abdominal distension, especially when you're first starting. Sometimes even when you titrate up slowly because um, it's just the body's getting used to more fat and this kind of fat. And um, we increased the MCT oil some more, and that did help improve the bowel movements. And after going up to 30% of total calories in MCT oil, which also increased the ketogenic diet ratio, um, that was improved with having more regular bowel movements too. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about MCT and GI related conditions, including short bowel syndrome, intestinal failure, liver and pancreas, and honestly, this whole section could be its own lecture as well. So um, just if you're interested in delving further in, there's some really good references and I'll just delve into a couple of them. Okay, so MCT oil can be useful in any kind of disturbance involving digestion and absorption. And the reason why anything that's got disturbed bile secretion like cholestasis, disturbances in hepatic intestinal circulation of bile acids, intestinal dysbacteriosis or pancreatic lipase secretion problems, uh, celiac disease, short bowel syndrome, after bowel transplantation, inflammatory diseases of the bowels, 
any disturbed outflow of lymph, like after some cardiosurgical surgeries, intestinal lymphatic diatasia, that's a mouthful, some metabolic diseases, sometimes even in reactions to um, severe food allergies, and sometimes in preemies. And the reason is really that with MCT oil, you don't need those bile acids um, to metabolize the MCT oil the way you do with the LCTs. So it's like you skip a step um, in the fat metabolisms, so it can be more efficiently metabolized, which can be helpful in some of these GI disorders. And uh, as a result of that, sometimes you can have better absorption of calories. So a lot of these diseases, really the reason why you're using the MCT uh, in addition to it being more efficient is that you've got malabsorption going on. Maybe you've already got weight loss happening by the time the MCT oil is utilized. And so you can have more efficient absorption of the calories you're providing with the MCT, then you can help start to put some better weight and nutrition back on too. Okay, so I'm not gonna read through this whole visual, but uh, it is a nice uh, overview. It's from a systematic review of the use of MCT oil. And uh, so I just wanted to provide it for you to look um, if you were interested in some more research, because I'm only going to be over a couple of the GI conditions I just discussed. And this is from a 2018 review study, so fairly recent. Okay, so one GI indica indication for using MCT oil is pancreatic insufficiency. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why you might have pancreatic insufficiency. You can have pancreatic insufficiency from cystic fibrosis disease. You can have it from a various other GI disorders. Um, and so the first recommended treatment for pancreatic insufficiency is the use of pancreatic enzyme therapy. Um, and that's just to help you digest and absorb your nutrition better. However, there are sometimes conditions or people for whom those and that enzyme therapy isn't enough or it's not working so well. And so then a second line treatment, if the enzymes are not possible, might, might be MCT oil, except um, do not use an acute pancreatitis. And so some research supporting this is in a Smirsky AL study showing MCT as compared to LCT had no effect on bilirubin output or gallbladder empty, emptying or CCK release in pancreatic insufficiency. And in a UVA nutrition issues in gastroenterology recommended using more MCT and less LCT um, in pancreatic insufficiency for better absorption. And again, just MCTs are better absorbed than the long-chain triglycerides, but you still might need enzymes. In other words, there might be some cases where you might utilize both treatments to best help the patient put back on some weight, absorb their nutrients. There's no advantage when replacing the LCT with MCT when enzymes are used because they kind of have two different uses. So another GI condition in which we might utilize MCT oils in short bowel syndrome. So you might have um, fatty stool steatorrhea after having a uh, short bowel syndrome related resection. So really you would only look to use MCT oil in this case, if more than 100 centimeters of the terminal ileal resection happen, you really don't need it if it's less than that. Um, for improved absorbed energy together with a higher carb diet maximizes the nutrient absorption. And there's a faster digestion of MCTs than long and short chain fatty acids, um, because you kind of, we have that more, like discussed in the last slide, you have uh, more efficient metabolism of MCT than other fats um, because you skip that step. And um, the research also shows improved endocrine and paracrine intestinal adaptation with the use of MCT oil. So, okay. Um, Another case study on a GI-related patient, Happy Gilmore, was a 30-year-old male with chronic pancreatitis and had difficulty taking pancreatic enzymes consistently and also was experiencing postprandial pain. And so they tried a trial addition of MCT oil into the diet. And again, it always has to be started slowly. So introduced a teaspoon after every meal 
to start and started reducing the other fat um, to not push that postprandial pain. And then it was titrated up over time, over three weeks to do one tablespoon per meal three times a day, and then one tablespoon per snack as well, one to two times a day. And this is supported by the research that five tablespoons a day is a, is a sweet point with um, supporting chronic pancreatitis and better absorption. And as a result, the patient had improved weight and they had a big reduction in their postprandial discomfort. So it was a big success with them. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about all the reasons why you would use MCT oil. Now we're gonna talk about how. So some serving size suggestions I think you kind of get from the case studies. You always want to start small, see how the body responds to it, and you're particularly looking out for any loose stools, any abdominal distension or cramping, and those are some things that could go away after using the MCT oil for a couple days to a week. Um, but some people, they may not respond well and it may not improve over time. So that's important to just see. And then the second most common, well, the other, actually the most common symptom is loose stools too. So you really have to check in, um, check in with the patient or client and see um, how they're experiencing it. For some people, it's welcome if they were having constipation issues, but um, you just want to make sure it's not uh, becoming worse, especially if you want to increase. So uh, start at one to one and a half teaspoons and then slowly increase teaspoon by teaspoon each day or every few days until you've reached a daily dose of one to four tablespoons without any issues and um, definitely discuss with the medical team, you know, what the goal dose is in the beginning so you can work backwards to come up with a tea, with a plan. And uh, it's really better not to give all of the MCT once you're a goal dose in one go. Um, it's usually better to divide it into multiple doses per day, like a certain dose per meal or snack. Um, at least at first, uh, there are some times where once it's well tolerated, if you're trying to get it in and there might be an unusual situation like a patient has to go to a conference they're participating in, maybe they're gonna that one day take it as a big bolus, but for the most part, it's better spread out. Um, and also you really have to make sure you're gonna meet those essential fatty acid needs because MCT oil does not provide it like we discussed before. And uh, also some fat soluble vitamins, especially vitamin E. So just make sure that you do the math on what their essential fatty acid needs and you're gonna meet it a different way. Okay. So I wanted to give you an example to showcase the titration for tolerance. And so um, going over to keto world, um, we used um, MCT oil in this case to boost ketosis and somebody on the modified Atkins diet. And just to give a little context, um, modified Atkins diet in keto world is different than in general adult world. So uh, it might be something like five to 20 grams of net carbs per day and an increased amount of fat. And so this patient had been on the diet for two months and starting it for hard to treat seizures in a 10 year old boy and they were growing normally. And there was concern for constipation since starting the modified Atkins diet, despite getting enough fluids and encouraging as many um, vegetables as we could. And then he was having one bowel movement like every four days and it was a Bristol school, stool score of one to two, so not great, which is very common by the way, when we start a medically prescribed low carb, high fat diet. And so we then added in at that two month on the diet mark, MCT oil to see if we can help the constipation and side benefit, it also would boost ketosis. So we started at that recommended five grams or one teaspoons of MCT oil three times a day, which then provided about 7% of total calories. So we had to adjust to make sure we're not giving too much fat, but enough. And um, the bowel movements improved a little bit so we had one every two to three days versus one every four days once we did that. And 
it moved up to solidly a Bristol stool chart of two. Then we in increased some more to two teaspoons or 10 grams three times a day to provide 14% of total calories. And then he started having some abdominal cramping. So we kept it there for an extra week to give it some time and see if his body adapted to it and the cramping resolved and it did. And so then at week four, we went up one more time to 15 grams or one tablespoon three times away a day to provide 21% of total calories. And then we really optimized the bowel movements to that optimal um, stage four or sometimes stage three bowel movement once a day. So it really helped this patient improve in their constipation. Okay, so where does the dietitian come in in conditions where you would use MCT oil? So um, you want to evaluate if your client or patient could benefit. Hopefully this presentation could provide a little start to that, but you definitely want to delve more into the specific reason why you're doing it and make sure that um, there are no contraindications like discussed earlier and that the client might benefit from it. And then you want to collaborate if there are other providers involved to explain why and to agree on a plan together. Also consider possible costs to the patient financially. So this is where we're talking about, you know, it's better to use pharmaceutical grade or a medical nutritional product uh, of MCT oil, but that might, need, might not be possible depending on what state or whether it's a pediatric or adult patient to get it covered uh, through insurance. And then if cost is an issue to a client or patient, that might be a reason where you need to discuss together, you might wanna just use any retail version of MCT, but if you're doing that, it's good to stick with one brand when you can. You also wanna educate your client or patient about the potential uses that, as applicable and get their buy-in on it and assist them with a plan for how they'll get the oil in, recipes, and how to titrate it up and check for those possible symptoms when starting that we discussed and monitor then for how they're tolerating it and any potential side effects. So to choose a quality MCT oil product, we want to use a product that contains mostly C8, C10, or both which is most of what's out there, but um, you just wanna avoid MCTs that contain lauric acid, which if you remember from Laura's discussion earlier is gonna be less effective for all of the health conditions that we discussed. You wanna to try to buy MCT in a glass bottle, or if it comes in plastic, transfer it to glass. I'm gonna be 100% honest, in my 10 years of using MCT, I learned that while I was researching for this presentation. And it turns out that um, some of the plastic chemicals can leach into the MCT. And then you're then ingesting that. So as much as possible, keeping it in glass will avoid or reduce that. Um, MCT oil is liquid at room temperature and use pharmacy grade whenever possible. Um, also remember that most MCT oil is derived from coconut. And so you need to take care if you've got a patient or a caregiver who has coconut allergy to get it from a non-coconut source like palm oil. Okay, so this is an example of an MCT oil that you might find in a grocery store. And to just zero in to um, the product's nutrition facts where it tells you how much MCT oil is provided in this product. And you might think, well, it's MCT oil, obviously isn't all same MCT oil, but if you remember, what Laura was talking about the different forms of MCT oil. There are powders, there are, um, might be fillers in those powders. You might have flavorings added or other things added and mixed into the product. There's all kinds of things out there these days. And so um, the thing might not be pure MCT oil itself. So that's when it is good to look at the label and also um, just make sure you're giving instructions to your clients and patients when they're going to buy one if they are gonna be using a retail one, how to buy a good one, or just make sure that they're really gonna be getting the dose of MCT oil that you've decided together would be best. 
Okay, so how do we use it? And I'm gonna turn it over to Laura um, to talk a little bit more about that. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so I know we're running out of time here, so I'm just gonna go over this uh, pretty quickly, but I will say this slide and the next slide are both gonna be in your reference document that we send out later. Um, so you will have this slide in the next slide, but ways to incorporate MCT daily. So personally, one of my favorite ways to work with clients is just adding it to a hot beverage. So coffee or tea, you make the tea, you steep it, you, you brew your coffee, and then you can add the MCT after it's brewed. Cause again, being cognizant of that temperature um, and just trying to make sure that we treat it with respect. I will also say um, I have a lot of uh, patients that add it to like a smoothie or a meal replacement or a protein shake, and that really can help with the palatability. So while I certainly have some patients that would just take it like a shot, and though they were always big troopers to me, um, I would say adding it to some other type of food really does help in terms of tolerance. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. You can add it to casseroles, you can add it to yogurt, you can add it to uh, oatmeal. There's really an endless opportunity of things you can add it for or add it to. You can also drizzle it on the top of you know, salads, pasta dishes. So just trying to give people tips on what works for them and so that they can be successful and adding it if they need to. And then the next slide is just a way to uh, just two recipes on uh, fat bombs that I just wanted to leave with y'all. Now, keeping in mind that a fat bomb is you're going to want to use coconut oil because coconut oil so is solid at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. MCT oil is still liquid at zero degrees Fahrenheit. So if you want a solid product like a fat bomb, you're going to have to use the coconut oil products. Now, with that being said, you know, again, coconut oil, primarily C12. So you can maybe later in the day focus on some more pure MCT options to kind of balance that out. Uh, we'll have a few questions here. Uh, the next slide just shows you that we do have an upcoming webinar on June 7th with our good friend, Dr. John Bagnulo. We're going to be talking about the anthocyanins role in oxidative stress and chronic disease. So I'm really excited about that one. Registration will be open soon, but I did want to save the date on that. Um, okay, Lauren, are you ready for some questions? I know we only have a few minutes, my friend. Let's do it. All right. Um, okay, so do you ever find that those with a sensitivity to MCT oil and even the powder can eventually overcome the intolerance? And I'll let you take that one. Yeah, um, so I think choosing carefully what you put it with and how you serve it could be helpful in that situation. So um, maybe if you mix it into a protein or a little bit of a carb, it might be better tolerated than if it's just in a liquid like coffee. So if they're having tolerance issues, I think I would try that first. Second place would be if that doesn't work to maybe change how you spread it out through the day. So maybe instead of three times a day, one with each meal, you'll try it four or five times a day and spread some into the snacks too and see if that decreased dose more times throughout the day might help. Great, thank you. The next question is, what is your experience in using MCT oil in protein losing enteropathy? Um, and so I can take that one, and, or we can both take that one, Lauren, but for me, you know, most of the time with protein losing enteropathy, there is some involvement, not, not all the time, but most of the time there's some involvement with the lymphatic system. And so because MCT doesn't involve the lymphatic system, it's a great option if you're taking out those long chain fats and replacing them with medium chain triglycerides, it can help the patient gain back some weight, get some better absorption going. So I don't want to say almost always, but our GI team, a lot of times when we had a kid with PLE uh, that had some form of lymphatic involvement, we definitely focused heavily on MCT for calories um, while they were going until the, the PLE resolved. So it's a great question and 100% a good role for MCT there. Um, Lauren, what was the highest ratio you hit on your traumatic brain injury patient in terms of the ketogenic diet ratio? 
Um, with that particular patient, I believe we went up to a 4.75 to 1. Um, sometimes in the ICU, you will use way higher ratios and amounts than you would typically use outpatient because of the severity of their seizures uh, prompts you to just want to do whatever you can and prioritize that over making sure you provide enough dietary protein acutely. Um, it's always a balance, especially if you've got, you know, like someone from a motorcycle accident, you also need to try and help wound healing. So it's all a balance, but in that particular case, 4.75 to one, and I can't remember off the top how much MCT oil, but when we pushed it, it was rising the ratio with MCT oil. Right, and our last question that we'll have time for is, is MCT oil as effective when it is uh, in a formula versus alone? And so I think it's a great question. I think it depends. Um, in general, the tolerance is better when it's within the formula, because again, like Lauren and I have both alluded to, you know, when you have the protein, you have the carbs, you have some long chain fats, you're not absorbing it all quite as immediately. So it's easier for the GI system to tolerate. It also makes the patient's plan a little bit more simple than having to do, at least in my experience, if I have somebody who's, let's say, doing a formula, a bolus feed six times a day, and then, and that's a lot in itself. And then you're asking them to do maybe do MCT oil additionally, and maybe they're doing some other protein modular too. It just gets really complicated. So I try and use MCT within a formula just for, for convenience and compliance and tolerance. Um, but there's certainly then other situations where, you know, doing MCT by itself is, is also fits the needs of the patients in the situation. So um, I think either way is fine, just on a unique basis based off the patient's needs. So. Um, well, that is, we have already spent three minutes over our time. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we will have, this was recorded. So in about one to two, three weeks, the recording will be available on our continuing education site. This was pre-approved for one CPE unit through CDR. So you should get your certificate by the end of the day today. Uh, we ask that you fill out a survey so we can continue to offer these webinars and do as best of a job as we can um, with what y'all want to hear about. So have a great rest of your day and um, happy Wednesday. Thanks everybody.